Good morning. How are you doing this morning? Well, I mean, we got standing room only. In <laughs> So welcome once again. It's a pleasure and a privilege to just be in front of each and every one of you. My name is Daryl Ann Watkins. I am the Senior Program Manager for UNCF Institute for Capacity Building. And um, each of my colleagues will introduce themselves as they come up. But I want to talk to you a little bit about what we do at UNCF Institute for Capacity Building. Um, most of you may not know we are a 37 member institution organization. Um, that means that 37 HBCUs um, pay or to be a part of our, our organization, right? We service HBCUs, predominantly small black institutions, right? So we developed what we called, well, let me, let me step back a little bit. In, our institutions receive sub-grants from us. So we have funders like Walmart Foundation or Kresge um, Foundation that gives us don funding. What we did initially was that <clears throat> we sub-granted to our institutions. <clears throat> what that means is we developed a program, whether it's enrollment management, institutional advancement, institutional effectiveness, finance, some very key areas of the institution to help build capacity. We will choose um, a select few of institutions to participate in the program, offer them funding, technical assistance, and some professional development to implement on the institution or at the institution. While that was impactful to our institutions and helpful, the challenge was we were piecemealing the assistance, right? So um, you receive a grant in enrollment management. We go in. We provide technical assistance. Here's enrollment management. Yay, good job. Consultants go in, taught them something, and then left. However, at our institutions, the challenge we're experiencing is turnover, right? So as quickly as we trained and gave instructions and helped the inst institutions grow in a particular area, someone left, that intellectual property left, and the institution was left in the same position it was before. Beyond that, our institutions to be successful, our institutions need more than just one area of assistance, right? So yes, we helped you in enrollment management, but what about institutional advancement? What about finance? What about all of the other areas so it was not holistic in any way? In 2015, we received a grant from the Lilly Endowment, in, um, I'm sorry, the Lilly Endowment, Inc. The purpose of that grant was to increase student success or student outcomes. How can we graduate our students, help them get to college, matriculate through college, graduate, and then have, secure a job, a career that is meaningful to them? Student outcomes. Most of our institutions, when they received an opportunity to participate, we sent out an LOI, about 70 institutions responded. And they all said, career services, career services, oh, we want technology, and we want to hire 10 million people, and we want to deck it out, you know, um, put signs and wonders all over the place and make it big and huge, and it's going to be wonderful. And you remember that movie, If You Build It, They Will Come, that <laughs> kind of mentality. Um, but we understand that they will not come. It doesn't matter how much you build it, they will not come. So then what do we do? We developed what we called a three-pronged approach. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in a second. 
but what we did to ensure that we are impacting institutions from different levels, we did a down select. 70 institutions applied to the LOI. Everyone was career services. We said, no, we, we want you to change this. We want you to fix this. Between the LOI and the planning phase, we were down to 30 institutions. We de uh, down selected to 30 institutions. Between the planning phase and the implementation phase, we are now down to 24 institutions, down selected to 24 institutions. And you can see the institutions that are participating um, in the screen behind you. So out of those 24 institutions, 23 are HBCUs. One is a predominantly black institution. Out of the 23 HBCUs, 19 of them are our member institutions. And the other four are state institutions. So Morgan State, Tennessee State, Fayetteville State, right? And, and you can see we represent 12 states, 54,000 students in. The whole idea for us is that we have to stop operating in silos, right? We have to stop operating as separate entities and realize that there are strength in numbers. And so besides institutions that receive individual funding, like Fisk University, we also have institutions that received funding as a cluster. So for example, Claflin University, Voorhees College, and uh, Benedict College came together as one unit and said, how can we benefit from bringing together our resources? And Ms. Valeria Green, she will talk a little bit more about her work, but she is sitting in the what we call the state office. So that is the governing, eh, I won't say governing body, but the body that helps uh, drive the cluster work at those three institutions. And we have three other clusters that go with them. They received anywhere from $1 million to $2.5 million, and the clusters received about $3 million. So we developed and designed a, an approach for student success. That approach is called the three-pronged approach, and we are concentrating, of course, in three areas. The first is guided pathways. So how do you make everything at the institution easy but the learning? Think about the operations of the institution. So for example, um, FAFSA, filling out the FAFSA what the student experienced in financial aid. You can talk about career services. You can talk about 15 to finish, that it's not 12 credit hours um, for to, in order to graduate in four years. It's 15 credit hours. These are things that our students need us to, to help. We, let's talk about intrusive advising or, or proactive advising as some, uh, as some institutions would prefer to call them. Everything made easy for the students, make them ready and engaged to learn. The other two approach is very much connected. We have curricula enhancement. How do we tweak the curriculum in such a way that it ch we change the pe pedagogical thinking, the pedagogical approach to teaching? How do we tweak it? How do we include stackable credentials. I heard someone talked earlier about badging. How do we include those opportunities into the curriculum? The personalized learning, so many different aspects of tweaking the curriculum to help and focus on our students. And finally, integrated co-curricular engagement. And I think this is where this body of work sits, right? Um, that opportunity for internships and experiential learning and 21st century readiness skills. What does that look like uh, for our students more than them having to just take it upon themselves to go to career services, to ask or seek the support that they need? How can we integrate that support 
into um, the curriculum. Uh, so we want our students upon matriculation to be ready to earn. They have all the tools necessary to be competitive in the job market. I have the pleasure of supporting the Carolina Cluster, um, which includes the three universities <coughs> that Daryl Ann indicated. Uh, a critical part of our role as a state office, uh, again, there's an executive director, Kathy Franklin, um, who sends her greetings. Um, she's back home in South Carolina. Myself and then um, a team member um, that supports administrative functions. And then another team member um, that's actually a team member of Claflin that helps us um, with the data pieces. But a, a critical piece of our work is monitoring and supporting. Now, again, just to keep staying in the mode of the purpose of, of the session, is to really focus on the co-curricular engagement piece, right? And then skills development. How, what does that look like in our world? And so that will be where we will focus. If there's more conversation you'd like to have about the our process, we can certainly let you know. Now keep in mind, this is a fluid process, right? We're in year three. It's a five-year grant, but the vision of the UNCF and Lilly Foundation is for this not to be a one and done, after five years that this becomes the culture, right? Um, the work that continues. And so Latrice and I are going to speak to you from two different vantage points. Uh, one, for me, I'll give you insight about what's happening from with the Carolina Cluster. Latrice, as the executive director of uh, Fisk University, under, still under the Career Pathways Initiative, will speak to you about what's happening at Fisk. Okay, so we'll tag um, along the way. But, so the center of this, or the keystone to this, was in alignment with the curricular redesign. Again, with a focus on the skill development and integrated co-curricular engagement. There was a very intentional and intense with um, purpose engagement to revisit the general education pieces. Most of us know that to be, okay, first year, second year before we get into the core courses. But that went through a complete revamp. For some, it reduced general ed courses reduced by 50%. And the purpose for doing that was to ensure, as Daryl indicated a moment ago, that the 21st century competencies, the skills that employers, subject matter experts from various industries, uh, again, were vested in, in this, this uh, grant to help us ensure that we were in alignment with their needs, right? And so with that being said, that went through an overhaul. Then there is intentional co-curricular engagement, critically important. The employers consistently share with us, and I see employers, please know that that's inclusive of private sector, public sector, higher education. These are the ones that are looking at our talent, considering are they a fit, we're interested in recruiting, hiring, extending offers, or not so much. So their feedback gave critical information that was helpful to that, that uh, engagement. What should that look like? And also, what should it be included or eliminated from the core courses? Now, as an aside, yes, we're still going to be ensure that we're in compliance with SACS accreditation. So the subject matter experts throughout this process were very intentional about that. The other part was enhanced advisement. Just to let you know, I'm a 90s baby for undergrad. And so it was, get your curriculum, don't lose that sheet of paper. Because that's the curriculum you come in with is the one that you'll follow. What if something happens um, uh, sophomore year? Well, no worries. Do you have your sheet? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, those are the lists of courses that you'll take. Yours won't change. And so... The enhanced advisement is completely different from what I experienced as an undergraduate student. It's very intentional. The vision of the, the universities were to ensure that there's some career coaching occurring, that everything is happening with purpose in alignment with the uh, long-term goal, the vision of the student, what career path they'd like to be in. And then obviously, the first year experience is critical, right? We're still thinking goals. Uh, Covey talks about beginning with the end in mind, right? So, again, it's also making sure that first-year experience is on par. 
now universities, our universities for the Carolina cluster, really focus on not just redesigning the first year experience, but also a few are also focusing on the second year experience. Mm -hmm. Please keep in mind, again, this is a fluid process. And we're, we're in what year? Three. Three, mm -hmm. okay. So then the integration of the NACE competencies makes it even more important. The research that was provided back in 2018, if I'm not mistaken, and we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about what those are, and I know most of you have committed those to heart, but we'll revisit them in just a moment. How should that look? Not just in the curriculum, but how, what should that look like in my syllabus? Um, what types of uh, intentional co-curricular engagement should we be considering in the syllabus? And oh, by the way, now we're allowing some other partners, and you'll learn more about that very shortly, um, about how our external partners and internal partners are working collaboratively as a result of this grant. It's, it's still a fiscal uh, focus, if you will, but things are, are trending in the right direction. So again, I'm speaking to you from what's happening from a collaborative standpoint, and I'll take a step back and also share the vision of the presidents and CEOs of these institutions, the three that I shared prior, put together a memorandum of agreement so that we didn't vacillate about the level of engagement, but there was a, a strategic plan about sharing resources, having cross-institutional engagement, and so I'm excited to share what that looks like in just a moment. Now, Latrice will give you more insight about what's happening at this. So we're doing some of the same things. So I don't want you, I don't want to bore you and take you down this country path, but I do want to emphasize the cluster, they focus as a group. But as a smaller institution, we focused on those things as well. We really focused on advisement. We talked a little bit more about what does intrusive advising mean. So you'll hear me talk a little bit more about that because individually, the individual grants, we worked on certain things. So that's what we focused on. But all these elements went into play. Now, I wanted to highlight the co-curricular because that is the biggest piece. I think we, you mentioned earlier collaboration. You keep hearing us say collaboration because honestly, we do work in silos. Would you all agree with that? be honest. And sometimes it's hard to get things accomplished without support. And so at Fisk, we know that students are matriculating, but are they really getting advice? Because a lot of times students don't go to their advisors. And also when it comes to engagement, are we tracking the engagement to the level we need to? Because students will tell you that they've gone to A, B, and C, but are they really getting the skills they need to be able to successfully transition? And so that's what we're going to focus on today. Absolutely. And so the goal um, they are walking toward the goals. These uh, areas are helping us achieve those goals that we're all familiar with. Retention, uh, placement, graduation rate, and others. But again, uh, all these things were, are done with purpose to help us achieve the overarching uh, goals. So as we progress, um, again, just as a, a recap, and I know, I'm sorry if this is a, a repeat, but these are the areas that we're focused on as relates to the NACE career readiness competencies. Now, one might say, well, gosh, it's a lot to consider for every course, every curricula, et cetera. It's been very interesting to watch the work with the support of partners along the way. Again, the integrated uh, uh, co-curricular engagement examples are just highlighted here. But I can tell you it, will con it can continue to expand. The areas that I'm going to focus on are just a few um, because you can see them highlighted here. But uh, what's critical for that skills piece and the engagement we learn is exposure. And the exposure is critical through field studies. The field studies not didn't just engage our students. Faculty, when I say the um, one of the team members mentioned holistic development, there's been a holistic approach for eliminating silos or working to uh, uh, eliminate silos with academic affairs and student affairs working together. So you'll notice faculty, um, if you come a little closer to each individual institution, as well as looking at us as a Carolina cluster as a, a whole, we're being very intentional about utilizing those opportunities to sharpen the silos, not just of our students. What should they expect in terms of skills and competencies? What does the industry entail? What's the outlook? What's, what um, types of opportunities will exist? What opportunities exist within this particular company? 
and then how, what do I need to do to get there? And then they also get to, to uh, visit the site, talk directly to senior level management. And we've been very fortunate, um, I will share this, that most of our partners that are maximizing field studies with faculty are not just engaged in that one and done experience. It really is an intentional relationship. And so when we talk about the curricula, looking at syllabi, um, allowing faculty or asking faculty to partner with the students, it really is, like I said, I'm, I'm reflecting on myself again for an ephemeral uh, moment, it's quite unique from what I experienced in the 90s for undergrad. They were, they're walking along with us to sharpen their saws. So it's been very interesting and, and quite um, phenomenal. The other side is the internship piece. Oh, I'm sorry, there was a question. Yeah, can you define field studies for me? Yes, yeah. so um, off the record, field studies, job shadowing can be synonymous. It'll, it's still an experiential learning opportunity because it allows the learner, and the learner can be faculty or student, to really better understand the industry, skills that are needed, um, the work, so they get to see um, the work. They get to speak with the team members or team leaders to better understand a day in the life. Um, some employers have been thoughtful enough to share their goals where there are strengths and opportunities for improvement. Um, they've also talked about um, where their needs lie in terms of hiring, not just immediate, but, but five years, 10 years from now. And that really allows the learner to better understand you know, what, what not only the industry is calling for, but that particular employer. And I will tell you that while some shadowing occurs, we've been fortunate because some of the employers have turned those into recruiting events, which has been great. Um, that students get to receive on-site feedback about their resumes, and there are a few employers as well in the past that have immediately started screening talent, which has been great. Thanks. Is that helpful? Yeah, yeah, okay, thanks for asking. Um, so for internships, that the institutions are being very intentional about the co-curricular engagement and again, having internships as a requirement. Now, not all of them have to have an internship. The requirement is co-curricular engagement. And that varies by institutions. Some might require one touch point in the areas. Some require two. But there's a very intentional engagement behind the scenes that our students are experiencing at least two to three. And they're also working on ways to document it, as Daryl Ann mentioned on yesterday, having the co-curricular transcript that showcases um, that. So another reflection in the past, if there was an internship or co-op, it would show on one's transcript with the other courses. But this will be a supplement, and I'm sure all of you are familiar um, with it. Undergraduate research is another. Um, most of our students in the past, our students that were studying natural sciences, for the most part, um, our IT majors, for the most part, were having those opportunities on, on, on campus, right? And so the undergraduate research has just expanded immensely. As a cluster, I'm proud to share the vision of the team was to work again uh, through each institution to offer a summer undergraduate research program. Um, which also is helping the students successfully matriculate if they're shy of, of credit hours. So we can certainly do a deep dive with that with, through a one-on-one, -on -one, but I wanted to bring that slide in. Finally, the study abroad. Um, very intentional uh, resources to ensure learning outcomes are in place and then collaboration between universities to ensure uh, full engagement, resources, preparation. So those are just a few examples. It's not limited to this, this list. There's one of the partners focuses on leadership development, but you're seeing that competency show in different um, uh, curricula or programs. So again, they're still received in other ways. Latrice. And we're doing some of the same things, but I'm gonna highlight the uh, service learning because in our area, believe it or not, service learning falls under career services in the last year. And so they moved that area under me, which I'm excited about. Um, you know, it's more work, right? Um, but a creative approach to using the professional development and the service learning piece. 
and then taking those two things and moving them to under uh, global initiatives. So right now we're, we're collaborating uh, global initiatives um, with service learning being under my area, we are able to look at that differently. So the students would travel abroad, we're looking at a travel abroad experience this next spring, and you would take the service learning piece and the uh, professional development piece and incorporate it with the travel abroad experience. And so that's what we're trying to do to ensure our students can go other places and gain those skills and not just be there just doing that, 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 that travel abroad experience. Um, the other thing is we, we did a caravan, um, a passport caravan, which was exciting, we did it about two weeks ago, where we brought some partners on campus and about 100 of our students were eligible to receive passports. Now, I don't know about you, but that's exciting to know that someone has paid for your passport and you've gone through the training to receive one because what does that do? It provides exposure, right, and, and visibility to the students to have access to go other places and do other things. So that just happened with our global initiatives department. Um, it was with a grant. So when you have grants, sometimes it does afford you the opportunity to do other things. That's an exciting thing that's happening on our campus. Another thing that we're doing is student leadership development. Um, we actually have a, a, a focus on making sure our students are developed into leaders because that's a part of our mission. And so when they leave there, they should be able to go and manage a committee or lead a committee or lead an organization. And so we have an, a focal point on that and we have several opportunities for students to gain their leadership skills. One other thing I think I want to focus on is, uh, she mentioned something about field studies. We have a day in your field. We started two years ago. And what we do is we decide to target students who don't know what they want to do, the undecided, undeclared majors, and we offer an opportunity for them to go to a particular company or partner in the area. This last year we went to a, a health stream, which is healthcare. Um, we did a caterpillar. Now not all students want to do finance, but we wanted to open up the, the possibility of don't be limited by the discipline of the degree or even the major. Think of the possibilities. You might be a psychology major, had you thought about training and development. So opening up the door for them to see that if you go and spend a few hours with this company, to Valeria's point, they are going to spend time talking to you about what they do. They may have some mentoring opportunities. You may gain mentors out of that, that experience. And then critiquing your resume and telling you what the possibilities are. And sometimes it's not about us communicating with the students, but it is about our partners sharing this wide range of things that you could do when you graduate. And I think, that's, I think I'll just focus on those three for now. So just based on what Latrice said, none of this is possible without access. The partnerships are critical. And it's top down. I mean, the executive level leadership partners have a vested interest. I mentioned a moment ago that um, the administration, the, the president, his suite of executive leaders have to endorse this. It has become a part of the culture. Um, it's a part of the development of the student. And so um, the vision to even create the memorandum of agreement, and I won't repeat that, is, is one that was, was really critical and, and smart of them because there's a level of accountability which trickles down not just in the white spaces with employees um, or team members, but also in the work of our, our students as they matriculate and grow. The other part is, and, and again, it's a fluid process. Um, and I keep saying that because academic affairs and student affairs sometimes is listed, is oftentimes listed separately. There's been an intentional focus to be more intent on having inclusive engagement with both partners. And that's been helpful not just on the curricular side, but also student engagement. Faculty see our students, what, 95% of the time, frankly? Um, the students are taking at least eight to, uh, 15 to 18 credit hours. And then if they're in labs, that's taking a little more time. But with that being said, those partnerships are critically important. The consultants that have been providing us support um, as a result of the partnership with uh, UNCF and the, and the work to provide training to faculty. Um, and I'll venture to say also to the staff that supports. Sharpening the saw is critically important. And that's something that I would say I've been very fortunate to see under the, the work that Daryl Ed is leading for us. That's a part of the development of the leaders that are helping the students with their development. Uh, the other part, I'll take a step back and say that a part of my role is talent development with the leads, leaders um, in career services and, and academic affairs, providing training about experiential learning and with the support of employers. So 
Our employer partners are critically important, private sector and public sector. We have um, an executive advisory council that supports the cluster. There are 42 or three executive level leaders um, from Fortune 500 companies that had a vested interest. I'll give you an example. One of the partners and I are graduates of the En-ROADS program, En-ROADS Charlotte. En-ROADS partners students uh, with um, employers that have a vested interest in developing their leadership skills and then with success um, they have an opportunity to secure an internship. I was a part of the pre-college program. Graduated on Saturday, started interning and going through training on that Monday and had that as I successfully matriculated four years. These partnerships are critically important. Now the flip side of that is, is the partnerships with higher education. Our students that are even considering graduate or professional schools, those partnerships are critical, whether it's the McNair Scholars Program or um, some other SERP or SPAR, it's critically important to be, begin that engagement as early as second semester freshman year. There are lots of opportunities that our students are missing out on because of the assumption that there won't be opportunities for them. And so those partnerships have been helpful. The advisors have a specific role. They are serving as our advocates. So they advocate for us in the community, not just in our meetings <laughs> twice a year. They are endorsing and pushing UNCF, CPI, Career, uh, uh, Carolina Cluster. That's what's been really, really helpful to us. If someone said, well, where's the challenge with that? Well, the challenge in the past was not having consistent people in the portfolio that were helping to endorse the talent, okay? And it's not just application interview offer, it's, oh, we've had a lot of success, you know, in the work that we've done with scholarships and other initiatives. It goes a lot deeper than that. The other side is the curriculum support or curricula support. That's critically important. Because if they're endorsing it, when it's time to select where they're going to recruit, they're the ones who can say, you know, I've had a hand in that. Let's put them in. We've not been visiting with them formally, but this year, let's, let's do it. Here's what I know I've seen happen. Because we, as a, as a university, keep in mind, another university, right? Or private sector, public sector employer can endorse what's happening in the curriculum. They know what's happening with the student. It's critically important. The other part um, that's important with the uh, council members is that they are the ones helping us understand what competencies the students need to be able to showcase. More and more interviews are critically important. We, we know that in the past, employees would come and visit, host um, information sessions and on-site interviews. Now, they'll say, we'd love to meet, but let's meet virtually through a webinar. <laughs> and interviews will take place via video. So these partners have been thoughtful enough to help our students prepare through mocks and also um, be very intentional about being tough, about giving authentic feedback, or authentic, if you will, about giving feedback. That's important. The only way one can close a gap is to understand where gaps exist. So that's been really, really helpful. I won't go into detail because I think Larry just covered it. Um, but for me, it's, it's a little different because I'm working with just you know, myself and then the stakeholders internally. I'm working with the provost and the president, and they're my stakeholders. And so from top down, I am asking them to help to drive the mission. Because without them, it's not going to get done on the college campus. And so that's, a, I, I could go into more detail, but I know we're, we don't have a lot of time. So we're going to get through this so you can ask questions. Okay. So again, these are the ways that our partners have helped us, have spoken um, to that. Hopefully something sends out there for you. Oh, go ahead. And then, okay. I was going to go to the faculty. You mentioned faculty yes. engagement. Uh -huh. We have 18 champions Sorry. at Fisk, Sorry. and we provide stipends for them. And I know somebody mentioned in one of the sessions yesterday, sometimes you have to incentivize programs to get that buy-in and support. We give our stipends, we give a $1,000 stipend to our, our faculty who are engaged with our process. And they literally are, I call them, eyes and ears on campus, and they're out talking to the students and making sure they're doing development so they can be more effective in the classrooms. And then we also have ambassadors that also get a stipend to do the work on campus. But we actually keep those partners for about two, two and a half years, and then we will be rotating to a different set of champions on campus. Thanks, Latrice. And just in closing, again, everything we do is in alignment with our common goals. 
um, for the cluster. I mentioned them earlier, retention, graduation, rate placement, and, and obviously several others, but there's an intentional, they're common goals with an intentional impact. So that's us in brief, and we're looking forward to the dialogue that will continue through Q&A. Have we experienced challenges? Absolutely. <laughs> Even as a small um, a small HBCU, I've experienced challenges. I'm not going to get here and say that everything has been, like she said, easy. Um, but just because I'm not in a cluster doesn't mean that I don't still have access to other partners within the cohort. There are 23 other HBCUs, and I will be honest with you. We can call them, we'll meet up, we'll connect. They are literally a pool of people that can give us information, help us be more effective on our campuses. So I'm not in this struggle alone, even though I may sometimes feel like I'm on this campus and I'm, you know, you're needing more personnel, you need more funding, you need more staff. But at the end of the day, it is a collaborative effort and everything that I've been able to do on the campus is because I, I had the, the um, ears of the president and the provost and together we decided it was a major initiative and we need to move forward with it. So thank you so much for laying out some of the, the features of the Career Pathways Initiative. And one thing that we've noticed in our own research on internships is, and there's similar efforts going on you know, across different institutions um, uh, across the country. One of the things we keep on hearing is the importance of institutional culture. Mm -hmm. um, for example, the top-down administrative um, process you just described would never work at an institution like UW-Madison because the faculty would revolt. Because <laughs> the departments, they have the power. Mm -hmm. And so that's an institutional culture mm -hmm. question. We also noticed, and you heard Christian mention this um, this morning, that UT El Paso, because um, over 80% of the students are Hispanic, the, the racial and ethnic identity of the students really suffuses the, the way that the institution approaches a lot of these questions of institutional reform and um, internships. So I just wanted to pose a question. Is there anything about the institutional culture within the HBCUs you're working with, either pertaining to the actual college and or the, the black experience within these um, institutions of higher education that you could speak more about? Well, I'm going to start on a holistic level. So. Um, it's funny that you say that, right? Because believe it or not, even at our institutions, if the faculty does not buy into something, they will revolt also. Mm -hmm. You will find in most of our institutions, the faculty are actually running things. Um, the president have the title, but if the faculty does not buy in, it, does, it becomes problematic. Mm -hmm. Specifically when you're talking about an approach that's so heavy faculty driven, we have to take into consideration um, that it will not be successful without them and they need to agree. They need to agree. And how do we help um, get them to that place of agreement? Now, when you talk about institutional culture, um, with that in mind, we have to also recognize, or we must understand that part of culture comes with processes, standard operating procedures, policies. When certain components of who we are is integrated in the institution's strategic plan or the quality enhancement plan, you will find that various individuals will rally around that. Why? Because it becomes a must-have. It becomes what drives accreditation, right? So there's a lot of onus that can help drive culture on, in the institution when you look at policies and procedures um, and, and different operating components. The other thing, I had, there's an in institution, I won't mention his name, that I went to the other day. We did a site visit. And most HBCUs have a specific mission, vision, statement. You, you've, I don't know if you've heard of it, but there's such a thing as the Morehouse man, right? When a Morehouse man graduates, matriculates through Morehouse, there's something that is um, placed on the inside of them that makes them walk tall. Or we've, maybe you've heard of the Bennett Bells. At that time, they were all girl institution. There's something that creates a culture of understanding that we are infusing our young people with the confidence necessary to compete in the work.
place. So there is a difference now in terms of institutional culture and HBCU culture. And then what the majority of our institution, um, I'm sorry, of our um, students are bringing in. What are their experiences? What are they going through that drives us, right? What drives us is the understanding that we know that they're underserved. We know that we are, as an institution, are under-resourced. We understand that. We understand all of the opportunities we have to, um, or barriers that we are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. But we can't allow that to drive us. We have to overcome that so that our students can be successful at the end of the day. You know, it does, it, you know all the barriers, we can throw them out there. If you're a small PWI liberal arts um, institution, you understand some of the same barriers, some, some, not all, of the same barriers we're experiencing, right? So how do we bring all of that in um, to how we, how we expose our students to greatness, right? How do we listen to what they're going on? I think we had a conversation earlier about understanding our students from where they are in the space that they're in, and then accepting them from there, but then training them and teaching them on how um, to succumb even the thoughts of where they are, right? And internships, experiential learning opportunities as are ways of driving change. Did you want to add to that? Um, it's, you, you spoke, uh, you really hit every area, uh, Daryl Ann, but again, the partnerships are critically important. Uh, I can't, the external mm -hmm. partnerships are ones that help with those challenges. The voice of the employer, um, not when they're just, you know, signing big checks for scholarships, um, but they're helping with mentoring. Um, they're providing opportunities for the, the support, like we mentioned earlier. Um, interview training, uh, field studies, um, internships where students have mentors on site. Mm -hmm. They don't secure the opportunity and then feel isolated. It's a different time that we're in um, because of technology and the mindset of the generation that we're working with is because they have a lot that's going on. I, ours was, I'll speak to myself, was the big phone. Right. <laughs> it was so big that you had to figure out what book did you need to leave in your residence hall. I'm just being honest. They are 24-7 the world and what's happening in the moment. And so modifying the culture to align with where their needs are, as Daryl has said it eloquently, meeting them where they are, but allowing those external partners to help us is critically important. That way we can stop talking about, you know, the, the gaps that exist mm -hmm. with soft skills. You know, it's, it's, we, our chambers of commerce continue to share what employers are sharing with us, the hiring authorities, that this continues to be a challenge. Well, if they come in and help support the universities, and especially in our world, we're, yes, talking to the executive level leaders who can help drive the culture change, who can help implement, implement the policies and procedures, only then will you see that shift. And so that's all. That's all that's that. Ernestine Easter and um, Program Director of NSF. Oh. And actually one of the portfolios that I manage is the HBCU uh, undergraduate program. Mm -hmm. And I'm just saying all of that because, you know, I'm thinking putting on my, on my NSF hat. Please you do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, so, so I had, um, I've jotted down a couple of things. And one of the concerns, um, one concern, the question has to do with sustainability. You mentioned mm -hmm. sustainability. So you give them this infusion of capital to do some institutional transformation and coordination, all that sort of stuff. And as you mentioned, there is uh, quite, there is a very high turnover yes. in administration. <coughs> so my question has to do with how is it uh, that these institutions are demonstrating some plan to sustain these activities once this funding goes away. Mm. I, I assume that the, the grants are for what, three years, five, five years? Five. Yes, five. 
five years, okay. So at the end of that five year period, what are you expecting them to, to do to sustain them? Yes, so excellent question, I thank you. So first of all, I am very much in the weeds of this conversation with them. Um, <laughs> Valeria knows when it comes to funding, we or I do not allow them to fund things that would cannot be sustainable. So for example, mm -hmm. there's a lot of study abroad programs going on. They want to take their students, we've talked about that, they want to take their students for an experience that's well in line with the grants. But is it sustainable? Mm -hmm. After the money is gone in five years, how are you going to do that? How is, how is the institution who we've constantly said over and over again is under-resourced, how are they going to fund or continue to fund students doing study abroad or purchasing of, of um, capital equipment on a regular basis? How are they going to continue to, I have one institution that, um, in the beginning decided to do campus, um, I don't want, well I'll say campus labs. It's a huge investment, a great investment, but after five years it's, it's over $123,000 a year. To use CPI funds would be an easy um, answer to paying it, but after five years what, what, you gonna, what are you going to do? Excuse me, I'll be improper. What you gonna do? <laughs> what are we going to do? And so part of the question in terms of the budgetary part, right, is we are advising our institutions, first of all, that we're not approving budgets that makes no sense. That's the first thing. The second thing that we're doing is ensuring that we are data driven, right? What are we getting from our institutions is how are you documenting the work that you're doing, right? How are you telling the story with other funders? Because what the bottom line is in order to continue certain programming, you need additional funding you, in order to continue it. But being able to document the work that you're doing in such a way that other funders will be able to see um, through statistics, and we have here um, Dr. Deshaun Preston, who is one of our researchers in UNCF ICB that is, that is um, a part of collecting that and analyzing the information, and then being able to tell that story to our donors and others. So how are you doing that storytelling? The other thing is, as I said, policies and procedures. Policies and procedures. There is no way with turnovers the way it is at our institutions that we can continue just working off of what is in people's minds and hope that they stay around because a lot of times once you train faculty are the longest um, standing um, staff at an institution right so we, we, can't, uh, we can't allow that. So what we are encouraging our institutions to do is the things that the they are learning, the things that they are receiving, it becomes standardized, institutionalized. It becomes something that it is no longer a nice to know, but a necessity for the institution itself. We're talking about sustainability. Right? When we're talking about curricular enhancement, we're training our faculty to understand because we, we've only talk, we're only talking about the 21st century right now, but the 21st century is so fluid. It's, you know, things are changing on a monthly basis when you're thinking of technology and all of the other aspects that comes with the 21st century. So it's more than just I'm going to tweak this one time. It's about continuous improvement, mm -hmm. continual learning, right? So we can't, we can't just say fix it and done. 
it's about a, a mindset change that what I'm offering my students today may need to be tweaked again in a month, in two months. And I am open to that. That's sustainability, where you're changing the person as opposed to just a system. Does that make sense? And then the other piece, when we talk about integrated, again, the co-curricular engagement, all of it is, is tied to the fact that this world, our students, who we say we are passionate about, who we say that we are in the school system, I, I, I believe that anyone who's teaching young people, it has to be a calling. Or who's not just teaching, but who's working in that environment. It has to be a calling. It has to be something that you want to see their success, right? So what, we're, what we are doing is giving them an opportunity to first transform themselves, the way they're thinking, to then transform the institution. And then, so it's, it's, it's sustainable, and I think we said it er earlier, the term is very cavalier, buy-in, right? We say buy-in, everybody needs to buy-in. But really, it's change how we're thinking. And I believe that we're starting to see some of those changes. I don't know if you... I was gonna also make a, make a note about sustainability, um, so, I have a unique story because I was under student engagement when I first started at Fisk for one year. Then I, and then I was moved to academics. And then this last year I've been moved under institutional advancement. Now what I want to say about institutional advancement is that that's where a lot of the money comes in, the development dollars. The great thing about being under those different areas is it, gets, it allowed me to be able to um, learn more mm -hmm. and to position myself and leverage the opportunities. Sustainability to me is also having investors and partners that actually see what you're doing based on the work that we're doing um, as a collaboration with 24 cohorts, I mean 24 cohort of 24 institutions in a cohort, mm -hmm. you can send a different message about what you're doing on the colleges to show sus sustainability. But also coming from a corporate background, you don't want to invest in something that if they're not going to put money on the table. So um, one thing we've been able to do, and I'll give you an example, we started a FISC Executive Leadership Program, which is a, an internship model that happens all year long to increase our number of students who are getting internships. It has to be sustained. You can't start it and stop it. Um, I didn't use CPI money to do it. So what I was able to do was to partner with our uh, Vice President of Institutional Advancement to see if there were dollars there of partners that wanted to make an impact under their diversity and inclusion areas to be able to sustain, to be able to make sure it's sustainable. So the president saw it as a key and a signature program, has endorsed it, and so it's actually how we actually receive some of our funds out of university dollars. So a lot of times in order to sustain something you have to see that it makes sense for the university and it's going to be something you're going to keep up and you have to keep tweaking it along the way. So that's one of the programs that we piloted last year, we launched it, and now we have about 10 partners that provide internships and buy into the program because we sell it on the fact that it's decreasing student debt. That means if you intern during the course of the year when you're going to come out with X amount of debt, the idea is that you're going to decrease debt, which means the student is working and going to school and maintaining grades and having a holistic experience, that some investors and partners will buy into that and therefore you can create a level of sustainability. But that's just one program that I'm using as an example. Um, so I'm Whitney Williams. I work at Claflin University, who is a partner member for um, CPI. And so one thing I, I did want to highlight um, with the three-prong approach, um, I work more so in an integrated co-curricular en enhancement, um, I'm sorry, engagement. And so I think one word that was mentioned before that's very important is the intentional, intentionality of the co-curricular engagement. Because although um, internships are very important, it's important to dive into exactly what the student career path is and what's necessary. So again, what Daryl Lynn mentioned about the culture at the institution at Claflin, our mission and our motto is we want to produce visionary leaders. Mm -hmm. So everything is heavily centered on leadership. Mm -hmm. And so it may not be necessary that a particular major needs a lot of internships. And so what we've done, like a lot of the other partner schools, is identify five areas of experiential learning that the students can engage in and we said okay we want the students to get this experience but we made it a degree requirement that the students have to participate in at least one experiential learning activity before they graduate so 
internships is a part of that, but we also have undergraduate student research, leadership, study abroad, study away, or service learning. And um, keeping in mind what you know this symposium is about and what more research needs to be done, we're looking at you know employers saying that the students need experience. Where does that experience come from? You know they're thinking about critical thinking. Can they work the technology? And a lot of those things are in these other areas of experiential learning. So as we're moving forward and, and doing more research, look into how we can prepare the students for the internships and get them in some of those other areas so that when it's time for them to apply for internships, they sort of come with the experience that these employers are looking for. So not just really focusing solely on the internships, but what's necessary to get them to that step. So. Just recently, I would, uh, just to highlight that, just recently, the Carolina Cluster or the State Office hosted an HBCU talent showcase, first of its kind in that area. And I just want to piggyback off of what Whitney said. We have three institutions. This is the power of, I think, um, collaboration. And we'll talk a little bit about sustainability, too. Three institutions came together and said, we will prepare our students for this HBCU talent showcase. These three institutions through networking, and uh, Ms. Valeria Green is one of the key components of getting this done with uh, Kathy uh, Franklin, who's the executive director. Because of that, 120, 52. 100, thank you for the correction, 152 employers went to South Carolina to be a, par a part of this HBCU talent showcase. And according to the last number I saw, it was 776 students. So that was documented. We still estimate it was closer to 850 to 925, but yes, documented. Students, students from, uh, it was what, 9 to 12 institutions? Um, yes. Uh -huh. So they reached out to, part, to other institutions within the area um, to come and participate in this HBC talent showcase. And just because of this cluster coming together and say we can, because of our network, we can create this opportunity for our students beyond what even other people thought. We had larger institutions that were invited to be a part of it and ended up not being a part of it. Right, but other smaller institutions came to, together to do this work, and we had students who received um, job offers on site, internships on site. We had students who got called back for other interviews, opportunities that they may not have had before because of this cluster. And I'm so excited about it because talking to the sustainability piece because it was so successful, they're now calling it the first annual, <laughs> right? So they are able now to see and shift to have a second annual one coming up in 2020. So this to me is the idea of what collaboration, networking, and bringing ourselves together to be the great institutions that we are. This is what we can do, and this is how we can sustain it. By, by doing things with excellence, and funders and donors will be able to see that we're not just trying to get the money. We're not just trying to get the money to do what we want, that our passion is for student outcomes. Mm -hmm. Well, and just to supplement that, they were, they were people from the C-suite at this event, mm -hmm. executive level um, management, and that was important because of the visibility, but back to the um, leader with UNCF, we've learned that that is the way that we have to show up so that we can then deepen the conversation the relationship outside of a touch and go mm -hmm. um, from that and because of the student engagement readiness 155 on record 152 actively recruiting that this sustains itself so they can see the return on the investment which is critically important their goals are being achieved and then hopefully we can deepen that relationship but you're right it does take time Coming from corporate America and having a $15.3 million goal of new money, and that was my world for a while, it takes time to build that relationship. There are a few models that we've learned 
that we're applying um, as a result of the training from UNCF to, to support that sustainability model or relationship building model. But the other part that's critically important is that the right people are at the table, the people of influence are at the table to help us with that.